There's this Disney Channel show I'm sure you've all heard of about two siblings spending their summer break in a very unusual town in Oregon. The show is known for its mysteries, hidden messages, and cryptograms. Not all of these mysteries were contained within the show itself. The recent release of the Book of Bill has gotten me to look back on some of my experiences being a part of the Gravity Falls fandom. The good, the bad, and the bafflingly weird. Compiling the story of a particular event required me to go through ancient Gravity Falls wiki history, leading me down a decade-old rabbit hole full of axolotls and AI-generated sloth crypto. With the help of some friends and friendly acquaintances, my journey is complete. Bear with me, this tale is a complicated one. I was introduced to Gravity Falls fairly early on in the series. A friend and I had binge-watched it during a sleepover when only a handful of episodes had been released, and I was immediately hooked. Charming characters, intriguing mystery. The fandom was fairly small at the time, but sizable enough to find a community online. Fans would share secrets and help each other solve codes, hyping each other up for the next episodes. About two weeks after getting into the show, I found something. Alternate reality games, or ARGs, are interactive multi-platform games that generally take the form of websites, scavenger hunts, and or social media posts. Gravity Falls has had several ARGs over the years. The earliest of these, the Mystery Tour, consisted of Alex Hirsch prompting fans to find graffiti of Bill Cipher located around Northern California and Oregon. I had attempted to locate one of these images at Mount Shasta, but I had looked in the wrong area and said graffiti had been washed away by the time anyone was able to track down the spot. A similar event years later, the Cipher Hunt, was a worldwide scavenger hunt in search of Bill Cipher's statue. But there was another event. A website shrouded in mystery, with messages hidden in the source code. Searchfortheblindeye.com was a website that appeared in August of 2013, created by an unknown developer who is likely a member of the production team. The website appeared as a simple animation of Bill Cipher over a black background, with the show's theme playing hauntingly to accompany his presence. Every day, ASCII art of Bill Cipher would be hidden in the website's source code, with additional coded messages in or around the ASCII text. Each day the ASCII art would be updated and the message changed. The original site is no longer available, as going to the URL now leads to a suspicious link, but several archived versions of the site are available on the Wayback Machine. Suddenly, ASCII images of Bill Cipher were appearing in the profile pages of users in the Gravity Falls wiki. It wasn't long until people started to notice. Users began theorizing on who is leaving these messages and why. One user in particular wrote a series of blogs analyzing the mysterious user's activity. Their leading theory? That this user was the owner of the Search for the Blind Eye website, and that said owner was a member of the Gravity Falls production team, perhaps even Alex Hirsch himself. The messages and ciphers left behind got fans theorizing not just about the website, but of how all these clues tied back to the show itself. Was this sentence a reference to this book? Just a prank by a troll? Or was this all a facade for something more? This mystery started attracting attention from other wikis, primarily the Creepypasta wiki. Some users started leaving riddles and cryptograms of their own. But who was this mysterious user? On Friday, September 13th, 2013, a user by the name of Friday13 posted messages on the profiles of several users, along with posting this message into the source code of one user's profile page. They weren't seen again until several days later, when they again returned, left several hidden messages on the source code of user profiles, and again left several comments. Finally, on September 22nd, Friday13 posts a hidden message on their own wall before again entering the chat room. As Friday's messages became more paranoid, the blogs got more... questionable. The blogs never revealed a definitive conclusion, so what was really going on here? Quick interruption for some trivia. Did you know that Dipper and Mabel are canonically 25? Bonus trivia. Did you know that if you say hit that subscribe button in a YouTube video, it makes the subscribe button go all rainbow? And did you know that if you hit that subscribe button, I'll be happy about it? We need to rewind a bit. 
About two weeks after getting into the show, I found something. My family had gone on a trip to England. We'd run into a group of birders on one of our excursions, and I, being the bird enthusiast, happily struck up conversation. There was a particular species of bird everyone seemed excited to see, a songbird known for its peculiar ability to swim, the dipper. This is weird, right? This isn't just me who thinks this is weird? One stop on our trip was the village of Tintagel, an old town known for its association with the legends of Merlin and King Arthur. While on our way to the castle ruins, something caught my eye that made me stop in my tracks. It was abnormal for a stone to be so triangular. Smooth, flat, a greenish slate gray, a slit sawed one third down the middle. It seemed like it wanted me to have it. My parents had already disappeared down the path, so I tucked the rock into my pocket before running to catch up with them. I'm not exactly sure when things got weird. I vaguely remember pulling the rock out at night when we got back to the inn we were staying at. Part of me was worried about what would happen if my parents saw me with it, as if it was some sort of contraband. The rock, which I refer to as the keystone, was unusually cold. As I lay down, I had a sudden compulsion to place it on my forehead. This was something I shouldn't have done. I can't say exactly what happened next. Saying that things got weirder would be the best way to explain. All I really have to go off of is my own fragmented memories and what I was able to find written down from back then. Okay, maybe I do have a way to explain this quickly. This asshole. I need you to understand that at this point in the series, Double Dipper had just come out. Bill Cipher had only appeared at the end of the opening sequence and in a few suspiciously triangular windows at the Mystery Shack. If I put that rock on my head before going to sleep, I would get vivid lucid dreams. And guess who was in all of them? This bastard. The first time he appeared to me, he told me that it would rain the next day. It did, in fact, rain. He formed himself into a sandstone pyramid before attempting to smash me in Dipper. Those vivid lucid dreams were of me, in Gravity Falls. Two weeks in the fandom was enough time for me to have already created a self-insert OC, so this was naturally who I became during these lucid dream episodes. This isn't to say that having vivid dreams related to a current fixation is at all unusual, but these had a narrative consistency and level of detail that my dreams rarely had. I'm gonna do my best to compile what I remember, um, just keep in mind that this all happened like 10 years ago, so this is just kind of what I could piece together from, like, dream journals and things that I had written back then. I'd arrived in Gravity Falls via the portal potty. Somebody. I was out in the middle of the forest somewhere before I stumbled on an old trailer that Dipper clones number three and number four, who I nicknamed Trent and Forrest, had been living out of since their escape. I somehow was able to get the trailer relocated to the Mystery Shack parking lot, where I made a deal with Grunkle Stan to help me make merchandise and entertain tourists in exchange for letting the trailer stay on his property. I did a lot of craft projects and art to sell to tourists, either through the gift shop or selling them outside, and also do some caricatures on occasion. Mabel would sometimes help me with making crafts, though her overuse of stickers and glitter was generally a pain. I mean, literally anyone who's ever worked with glitter, is, I hate glitter. <laughs> don't use glitter in your art and craft projects, please. Please don't. Dipper did not like me. He was pretty much immediately suspicious of me, and it didn't help that two of his clones were secretly my roommates. And the clones were not good roommates. Over time, I'd get these dreams less frequently, but Bill would show up more and more, even in the dreams unrelated to Gravity Falls. He didn't really say much at first, and never properly introduced himself, but his presence pretty much always was unsettling. The more agitated I was, the bolder he became, to the point he seemed like he was making a game out of it. He offered to help me get to Gravity Falls, if I was interested in going, and when I didn't seem particularly enthusiastic about his offer, he threatened to drag me there instead. I feel like you're starting to get where this is going. This mysterious user, Friday was me, panicking. Anyone who was paying close enough attention to what I was posting on my main account would have probably pieced together that my mental state was not good. 
I needed someone to talk to about this, but at the time I didn't trust anyone not to accuse me of being insane. I couldn't exactly go to my therapist and explain that I was being harassed by a yellow triangle. Dreamscapers, the first episode in which Bill Cipher officially appeared, gave me a panic attack. Shortly after, I learned about the Search for the Blind Eye website. Just... Looking back at these, I really don't blame myself for absolutely losing my mind. This is pretty much exactly how I felt at the time, and it felt like whoever was running this website could read my mind. It got to the point where I just needed to vent. To someone. Anyone. Anonymously. And so Friday was born. I really didn't think anyone would notice if I edited pages. I think in retrospect it should have been more obvious that people would notice, and there really wasn't a reason for me to specifically edit other people's pages. But when people actually did notice, I felt like there was finally an opportunity to explain what I was dealing with. In the same format as the website, for whatever reason. My intention was to vent for as long as I felt necessary, then disappear without revealing who I was or giving any context. That was not what happened. These blogs were written by an active Gravity Falls Wikia user with some controversy around them, who apparently now posts things like this to Twitter. Since their blogs drew some attention to what was going on with the Friday situation, more users wanted to sleuth out what was really going on, including the mods. During this time period, I had an internet stalker, who was previously a member of the Gravity Falls Wikia, who was banavating with alt accounts. This separate bit of drama was making the mods paranoid. Anyone who was paying close enough attention would have been able to figure out the connection I had to Friday 13, and my stalker was paying me quite a lot of attention. One of the mods at this point believed that Friday 13 was in fact one of my stalker's numerous alt accounts. So they banned it. They IP banned it. This caused problems for me that I was able to fix by appealing with the mods using my neighbor's computer, but Friday 13's ban was only reverted on the condition that I would have to come clean. So I did. And it didn't go well, because fucking of course it didn't. This video is already a lot longer than I intended. There's a few things that I'm probably forgetting. Maybe I'll make it part two? Anyways. The last Gravity Falls lucid dream I remember involved Dipper's clones. We were spending time crammed together in the camper trailer, and one of them tripped, knocking my stuff and the keystone onto the floor. It cracked and split into two pieces. I immediately woke up, and the keystone immediately fell onto the floor. It cracked and split into two pieces. I panicked and stuck it back together with scotch tape. This worked surprisingly well, though an odd black substance started to leak out from the crack. Fortunately, the tape did prevent it from leaking out all the way. When I moved out of my parents' house last year, I lost track of the keystone in the moving process. I knew that if I wanted to make this video, I really needed to find it to minimize the amount of eye rolls talking about this would get me. So I found it. It's- I don't want to- I kind of want to minimize the touching it, just because I don't really enjoy touching it. So I'm not going to take any of this tape off. Um, but if you look right here, you can see this is where it cracked. If my camera will focus, you can kind of see that right there. And then if you look right here, that's the black stuff coming out. There's tape over on this side because there's some superficial cracking and that pink stuff is microplastic that got stuck on the tape because microplastic is fucking everywhere. Um, and the triangular shape of it seems pretty intentional and this crack here is definitely made with some sort of tool intentionally. It does look like there is a little bit of black stuff under here, but it's kind of hard to see. It's a lot more obvious on the other side. When I'm looking at this 
microscope video of the keystone on my phone. My phone AI thinks it's food for some fucking reason. I think I need to explain all this with a calendar. Tourist Trapped, the first episode of Gravity Falls, aired June 15th, 2012. I first watched the show with my friends sometime around the end of July. We went on the trip to England in the beginning of August, and I found the keystone before Rational Treasure came out. At some point in this time frame, the dream started. I don't have enough records to say exactly when, so I'm just going to mark this whole section as the weirdness era. In red, we have the duration of the search for the blind eye and the time period of the Friday incident, with the fallout from said incident in orange. The next block of yellow is the post-season 1 hiatus, followed by the release of season 2 in blue and purple. Almost exactly a year after the Friday incident, we have what I will refer to as the sock op- Okay, I'm just gonna stop. I'm, I'm writing this right now, this script. And the keystone just fucking moved. I have it in this plastic case on my desk, and it just fucking moved. I'm gonna blame that on gravity, but it was- I had it sitting vertically. It's a- it's a square case. I had it sitting vertically, and it suddenly just started sliding very slowly down the desk, and I- I'm just gonna blame that on gravity. <laughs> I don't like that. I was sitting in my econ class, waiting for the teacher to call roll. He finished calling roll, but he hadn't called my name. I talked to him and asked me why he hadn't called me, and he started- he stared at the roll sheet before finally saying, I guess you aren't in this class anymore? I had been in the class for nearly two weeks. So of course I asked him what class I was actually in, and he said he didn't know and told me to talk to my counselors. My counselors also seemed pretty dumbfounded, but a few minutes after I talked to them, someone printed me a new class schedule. You're in Mr. Blank's class now. At this point, they mentioned that I had technically been in this class since the beginning of school, but no one had bothered to call home or that I was absent or truant or anything. For two weeks. So I go to my new class, a bit pissed off because I really like my econ class. I go into the class, and the teacher totally acts as if I was there the whole time and continues lecturing. That's when things got weird. Some subconscious part of me clued into the familiarity of his voice before I did. I don't think I really put two and two together until I saw the name on the teacher's name tag. Bill. To make sure I would put all the pieces together, it just so happened that he had a triangular pin on his name tag, was wearing yellow, and proceeded to describe how government was the only thing preventing people from stabbing each other in the neck with pencils. This is what I wrote about this event around 10 years ago. I'd misremember this as him wearing a bow tie rather than the yellow triangle shaped pin, but the rest of this is pretty spot on. For those of you wondering what his voice sounded like, I was able to find a recording I made during one of his classes. So, that was our first section that we already did. Karen, do you have any Then, we talked about different forms of government. Yeah. Now, we talked about England. Do I even need to explain? This one honestly wasn't as bad as the Friday situation, as I was more confused and mildly entertained than anything else. Bill the teacher was more of a chaotic good compared to Bill Cipher's chaotic evil, so even when he tortured Tickle Me Elmo dolls or broke school property during class, it just wasn't quite as threatening. Would give him a 10 out of 10 on Rate My Professor if that was something our school used. I've definitely come up with a few theories as to what all this was about over the years, but none of them fully explain my experiences, and I don't necessarily believe any of them. Theory 1. Bill Cipher is real. The Keystone actually summoned Bill Cipher. As absurd as this is, this is the theory that makes the most narrative sense, despite making the least rational sense. Bill Cipher is, for all intents and purposes, a fictional character with no jurisdiction in our reality. As for being the theory that makes the most narrative sense, objective reality doesn't have any obligation to make narrative sense. The entity that appeared as Bill Cipher in my dreams behaved much like he does in canon, even before his first appearance in the show. Many of the interactions we had mirror some of the interactions Ford Pines described of how he first met Bill. 
Bill harassing and manipulating a teenager into making a bridge to between dimensions is a very canon compliant and in character thing for him to do. The book of Bill added additional context that Bill had visited England long ago and worked with a wizard, meaning that the idea of the keystone being associated with Bill but found in England does oddly check out in canon. If Bill Cipher is somehow a real entity, the following conclusion could be made. The keystone was a remnant of his interactions with the British wizard I don't feel like pronouncing that. By coincidence, I stumbled on this fragment and took it home. The keystone contained enough bill re residue to allow him to enter my dreams and mess with my head, but there was never really any possibility of actually bridging dimensions, as even if there was an opportunity, a high school student didn't really have the time or resources to create an interdimensional portal. If this really was the same bill we see in the show, you like me saw me as like a backup option or a source of entertainment. This would explain why he became more threatening after the release of Dreamscaperers and why he stopped interacting with me entirely upon the release of Not What He Seems. Now that the portal in Gravity Falls was in working order, he had no need for to concern himself with a backup option. I'm not going to pretend this theory doesn't have glaring issues. Aside from basic improbability, the entity in my dreams who took the form of Bill despite otherwise behaving exactly as he would in canon, never told me its name. If it had introduced itself as Bill Cipher before the name was officially released on the show, there would be no question, but that simply didn't happen, and it kind of leaves some extra room for doubt. So what if there really was some sort of dream entity, but instead of actually being Bill Cipher, it was pretending to be Bill Cipher? I'm uncomfortable with this theory, not gonna lie. It's not exactly any better than the potential of Bill Cipher somehow being real, and it implies that there was something malicious in the stone that was similar in psychological nature to Bill himself. It does explain why the entity it encountered never introduced itself, but it also doesn't explain why everything it did or said directly tied back to the show. Shifting. Yes, I do mean that thing where Harry Potter fans would do guided meditations and cry about it on TikTok. While the whole trend of shifting wasn't something I got super into, a lot of what people sharing their experiences with it said sounded familiar. Spending dreams in a recurrent alternate reality with continuity between each night, odd astral projection and guided meditation rituals that often required you to sleep on your back, and this was the same position in which I slept whenever these dreams occurred. This seems plausible for explaining the dreams, but it doesn't really explain anything else. Theory 4. Mental illness. I feel like I can't make this video without at the very least addressing the elephant in the room. I do have multiple clinically diagnosed mental health issues. I do take medicine for them, and I've had a psychiatrist since before any of this happened. But of the disorders I have formally been diagnosed with, only autism spectrum disorder and derealization disorder really offer any explanation to these. A long time ago, autism was considered a form of childhood schizophrenia, as the perceptual differences those with autism experience were considered a form of psychosis by the neurotypical observers. While modern psychology recognizes autism as a distinct disorder, it does still have noted clinical comorbidity with schizophrenia and related disorders. It could be argued then that all of this was some sort of persistent delusion. There are a few problems with this. First and foremost, my mental health was fine up until shortly after I had found the keystone. While it's entirely possible that finding an unusual rock was enough to trigger a delusional episode, I really don't think it would be enough on its own. The keystone wasn't even the only unusual looking rock I collected that day, but none of the others displayed any sort of psychological effect. Delusions are usually more than just an absurd belief, they're generally pretty stubborn beliefs as well. My conclusion that Gravity Falls is real I guess wasn't so much an unshakable conviction as it was the best explanation I had for whatever was going on, and as absurd as it was to claim this out loud. At the time, the only real evidence I had to the contrary was that none of what I was experiencing should even be possible, or at the very least, extremely improbable. 
For the stone to by itself trigger some sort of psychosis, the only thing I can really consider as a plausibility is that the odd black goo that started oozing out of it was some sort of psychoactive fungus. Even then, I don't know of any species of fungi that would cause such an effect after minimal exposure, and that black goo didn't appear until the stone had cracked already, which was significantly after this had all started. Dreams aren't exactly evidence for anything here, as there's no way to provide evidence of what I dreamed about, and dreaming by itself isn't really psychologically abnormal. It seems more that my experiences were what caused psychological distress rather than the other way around. And I do feel like most people in my situation would have felt like they were going a little bit crazy, um, especially when you're wondering what the hell is really going on. So did I shift accidentally and then encounter a multitude of suspiciously specific coincidences that made me a bit paranoid? I'm willing to chalk a lot of what happened to coincidence, and I've already admitted those incidents that seem easiest to disregard. So many of them seem so blatantly specific that it's hard to ignore them all. Dipper having a similar color scheme to the bird, that's a coincidence. The porta potty being relevant in my dreams before being relevant in the actual series could also be a coincidence. The concept of an outhouse in a forest isn't exactly new, and the wordplay of portal and porta potty could have easily been thought up by both my subconscious and a show writer separately. June 18th being my parents' anniversary is a coincidence. The other 618s related to personal information that I'm not going to disclose, I'm willing to mark as coincidences too. The keystone being the same approximate shape, size, and color as the triangular piece taken from the statue of Nathaniel Northwest, I'm willing to consider that a coincidence. That weird creature that jump scared my mom and I when we were in a walk in the woods at night that sounded exactly like my height behind, yeah, maybe that was just an owl. Bill showing up in my dreams before being revealed to be a dream demon is not quite as easily dismissed, but sure. Alright guys, we're getting close to the end. So this was a lot. For those who sat here and listened to me ramble for however long this video ended up being, thank you. There's definitely some things I forgot to mention, but I think this did a good enough job at explaining what the hell happened exactly 11 years ago. I'm not going to pretend I have an answer for any of this, but I do have one last question. Who created the Search for the Blind Eye website? We'll meet again.